Hey guys, I know I did an unboxing for the Darksiders 3 Collector's Edition. I also did a full playthrough of Darksiders 3 on this channel. So now I'm going to give you my review of the game now that I'm done with it. I've had let some time pass. I finished it uh, about a week ago, actually over a week ago. Um, but here we go. Here's my review for Darksiders 3. Darksiders 3 was published by THQ Nordic and developed by Gunfire Games. It follows the story of Fury, who is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The four horsemen serve the Charred Council, who are responsible for maintaining balance in the world between heaven and hell. Going back a little bit into some Darksiders lore, there have been a truce with seven seals made between heaven and hell. And when these seven seals are broken, then the apocalypse be begins and the four horsemen ride to restore order. Darksiders 1 begins with the war arriving on Earth after the, believing that the seventh seal had been broken. Apparently the seventh seal had not been broken, so he is held captive by the council for a thousand years before he is finally released to try to prove his innocence. This journey is where Darksiders 1 takes place. Darksiders 3 takes place sometime during that thousand years that war is being held captive. The council summons Fury and brings her up to speed on their suspicions of war. They inform Fury that the balance between order and chaos is in jeopardy. The seven deadly sins have been released by an unknown force and are roaming the earth free. The council tasks Fury with retrieving the seven deadly so they can imprison them once again. Fury immediately travels to earth and embarks on her journey. After arriving on earth, you will soon find out that Fury is filled with rage and is the most unpredictable of the horsemen. She's a very arrogant and ruthless character who seems to care about no one but herself. With all that being said, there is still one thing that is undeniable about Fury. She's a bad bitch. So while she may not be the most likable character, she makes up for that being a pure joy to control. When you first start on your journey, you'll be equipped with only your whip, which is named the Barbs of Scorn. This will be your most versatile weapon with its range and general effectiveness against all enemies. But once you start progressing through the game, you will meet the Lord of Hollows after one of your boss fights. Although his motives are unclear, he will, however, begin to equip you with the four different Hollow abilities. You first get the Flame Hollow, which gives you the ability to jump higher, walk through lava, and also equips you with the Chains of Scorn. Next, you get the Storm Hollow, which allows you to glide and equips you with the Lance of Scorn. This was probably the most uh, maybe versatile, like just attack weapon aside from the flame ho or aside from the whip. But then next you'll get the Force Hollow, which equips you with the Mallet of Scorn. This was probably my favorite weapon aside from the whip, as you can use the Mallet to break through certain structures and also knock items from one place to another. While it's not the most versatile weapon to use for combat, I did find it the most satisfying to use as walloping demons with a giant mallet was extremely enjoyable. Or another benefit of the Force Hollow was that while you're equipped with it in water, you can walk at the bottom of the water bed as if you were like on land. So it kind of like weights you down in the water. Then finally you get the Stasis Hollow, which equips you with the Edge of Scorn. This is an oversized blade of, or sword while using the stasis hollow, you have the ability to freeze things. Like you can freeze water and then walk on it, or you can also freeze salvation, which is a boomerang type weapon, and throw it at objects from the distance and freeze them to help solve puzzles. One by one, you collect these hollow abilities, you will gain access to different areas that you previously may not have access to. These areas can lead either to new collectibles or new bosses. You'll travel to seven different main areas, which for the most part do a good job of identifying themselves apart from one another. I would say that the level design is maybe a little better than average. I did enjoy traversing through the world and I enjoyed the general design of the world, but at the same time, I didn't feel that the world was very immersive and the art design was a bit too washed out. Uh, while progressing through the world, you'll find a multitude of different collectibles. Some will be consumables, like increases your health or strength, some may be artifacts and such that you can take to Ulthane to upgrade your weapons with, and some items you can take to the Demon Trader Vulgrim, which you can convert to souls. You'll collect souls throughout through battling enemies, and as 
smashing random objects. And personally, I really enjoy a game that gives you credit for smashing random stuff. I find it a big letdown when a game lets you smash tables and barrels, but gives you nothing for it. You'll take these uh, souls to Volgrim, where you can either feed to him or upgrade your strength, health, and arcane abilities. Or you can use them to purchase artifacts and items that you can then use to upgrade your weapons with. You can also shatter random collectibles in, that you found throughout the world, which will return your souls as well. Then once you've purchased these artifacts and fragments from Volgrim, or just found them out in the wild, you can take them to Ulthane and use to up, either upgrade your weapons or equip, equip weapons with them. All in all, I found the upgrade system very enjoyable. Admittedly, I'm not someone who tends to like an extremely deep leveling up system. I felt like this was right on the threshold of just enough without being too convoluted and confusing. It took me about a third of the game before I completely grasped what all I was supposed to be doing, but I'm sure some people will think it's too simplistic. Moving on now to the combat. This as well as the character design are by far the strengths of this game. When you're controlling Fury, whether you're wielding a whip, mount, or any other weapons, you feel like a straight badass. They are all enjoyable in their own unique ways, and although this is a hack and slash style game, you have to be careful when encountering every enemy, whether it's a small grunt or a boss, because everything you can and will kill you if you let your guard down. You have to study every opponent and learn their moves because the combat is built around evading and parrying. If I were to compare the combat to any game, I would say that it is most similar to Bayonetta. Although it's not as fast or fluid as Bayonetta is, this is just the game that came to mind for me. Kind of how like when you evade at the correct moment and then time slows down for you to parry gave me a feeling of similar to Bayonetta. That combined with how Fury just comes across as such a bitch, but at the same time, sh she's such a badass that you can't help but love her. But to backtrack a little here about how I, c I said that the combat wasn't as fast or fluid as Bayonetta. So I'm not a frame rate doctor, but it feels like to me that Darksider runs around 30 frames per second. Now, there are times when you are running through the world and Fury moves a bit clunky, but while actually engaged with an enemy, I felt that she moved pretty fluid, meaning that the game may only run at 30 frames per second, but it seems to hold up pretty good during the combat sequences. I never encountered any noticeable performance issues during combat that altered my experience. And to note, I played the game on a normal PS4, not a PS4 Pro or anything like that. Now, although the frame rate wasn't an issue for me, the cam camera during combat was. This was one of the biggest issues with Darksiders 3, that being the camera. There are too many times that I found myself fighting multiple enemies in a tight corridor and either Fury or the enemies aren't visible because of the camera. Now granted, I can't think of a third person action game where I haven't encountered some kind of com camera problems during combat. The fact that you have an extremely precise with every enemy because every enemy can kill you pretty easily makes this something that I have to mention though. This didn't completely ruin my experience, but it's a noted issue. Finally, the character de design. Character design is something that the Darksiders series seems to knock out of the park, and they don't let down with this installment. There are literally so many different enemies that you'll encounter on your journey of defeating the Seven Sins. The detail and art design that went into each and every one really helps to make up for the shortcomings of this game. These also aren't just a bunch of reskins either. Each enemy will have a unique design as well as a unique set of moves, and you'll need to become familiar with them all if you're going to complete this game. As good a job as they did with the random enemies, they did an even better job with the bosses, as they are all fun and different experiences. All the cutscenes for the bosses are done very well, and the voice acting, while not being the best, is serviceable. Most of them are a solid challenge and bring a great sense of satisfaction when you defeat one of them you've been struggling on for a while. I remember for the original Darksiders, there was a certain puzzle element to most of the bosses, and that is missing from Darksiders 3. I would classify this as just a good old-fashioned boss fight. Trial and error, getting your teeth kicked in, if you keep it up, you will finally, finally prevail and triumph. The puzzles in general are not as widespread as the original Darksiders, 
I felt that the original Darksiders was almost 50-50, meaning that 50% of the game was hack and slash and 50% of the game was puzzle or collectible based. Darksiders 3, on the other hand, was more like 80-20 split, meaning that 80% of the game was hack and slash while only 20% was focused on puzzles and collectibles. The overall story was also not as strong as Dark the original Darksiders. They did have some decent character arc with Fury as she goes from being just a completely selfish and heartless protagonist to at least showing some signs of having a heart towards the end. Overall, I just felt that the story was alright, where the story from the original Darksiders seemed to keep my interest a bit more. I do have four major problems with this game. First being the camera that I already touched on previously. The second being the checkpoints. Some of the checkpoints are just too spread out. You often go have to go through five to ten battles or enemy encounters between checkpoints. And if you die on the ninth one, then you have to start back on the last checkpoint or Volgrim location. This gets quite old after having to fight through certain encounters two, three, four, or even ten times before you clear all of them and make it to the next checkpoint. Also, there is no actual hard save option, meaning that you can't go in into the options or menu and save your game where you are at. It saves your game whenever you reach a Volgrim location, but it doesn't really tell you that it's saving. You just kind of assume that it does. Also, it doesn't save your state after a boss fight. I was up one night trying to defeat Gluttony for like about an hour and a half. I finally did, and I waited through all the cutscenes. And once the cutscenes were over, I turned off my PS4 and went to bed. The next day I find out that it didn't save my game. Why? Because I didn't progress to the next Volgrim location after the boss fight. Needless to say, this was pretty frustrating. The third problem is the loading screens. Uh, Darksiders 3 is a game where you die a lot. You keep dying and dying until you master your opponent and then you own them and you feel great about it. The problem is that the loading screen between each time you die is anywhere from 1 to 3 minutes. This can really try your patience at times and war on me quite a bit throughout this game. And the fourth problem I have is a lack of gameplay options and save slots. You have three different save slots, but you can't have multiple save states on one playthrough, which I found very irritating. The gameplay options are just about as bare bones as I think I've seen in any game. There is an option for different difficulty settings, but that's about the extent of it. Uh, those were the only notable issues that I had. I know there have been complaints about the game being too difficult, but I don't feel that way. Uh, the game was much more challenging than the first Darksiders, and just know going in that the game is going to be a challenge, but it's not a cheap or unfair by any means. You will be challenged, but you have to keep fighting and getting better, and eventually you will get through to the next area or to the next boss. There was a certain boss about halfway through the game that I was stuck on for nearly three hours, and I too was just thinking that the game was just too hard for no reason other than to be hard. But finally I got past the boss, then soon after realized that I wasn't leveling up my weapons as far as I could have been. So, after I made the necessary adjustments, I found the game to be still challenging, but at a much more reasonable difficulty level. In the end, this wasn't a game flaw or bug, it was just me, the gamer, not playing the game as it was intended to be played. I wouldn't recommend the, the game to everyone, but if the game looks interesting to you, and you like hack and slash action adventure games, then I think you'll enjoy it. There are some issues. It's not a perfect game by any means, but I believe the good definitely outweighs the bad. Early on in Darksiders 3, I was enjoying the game, but in comparison to the original Darksiders, I felt it was a distant second. After completing the game, I can honestly say that the gap closed considerably between the two, and I kind of like almost could go back and forth to where I'm not positive like that which one would be my favorite right now. But the two are completely different games, uh, made by two completely different development teams. They're just made in the same Darksiders universe. I'm just happy that the series got brought back from the dead, and I really hope that the game does well enough so that they can see Gunfire Games do the fourth installment following the story of Strife. So that's it, guys. Um, so let me know down in the comments if you've got the game, if you've been playing it. Um, if not, if you're looking forward to getting the game or if you just are totally turned off by it. Um, also let me know if you have played it. Are you looking forward to seeing Gunfire Games take a shot at Darksiders 4 and see the storyline of, of Strife follow through? 
Um, if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to see more videos like this. See you in the next one. Later.